I had mentioned before, about 6% of the CCRN will have um, GI on it. Okay. I don't know why this is giving me trouble trying to move my slides. Okay. Okay, so we were talking about acute abdominal trauma, which can be caused from uh, maybe possibly a gunshot wound, blunt trauma, motor vehicle crash, any type of trauma to the abdomen. And um, whenever you have that, I was just telling you about different signs that you may have. Cullen sign, meaning that there's some ecchymosis around the umbilical site. And if you have kidney damage in the back, retroperitoneal retro bleed would be called Gray's Turner. And sometimes pain will radiate from the stomach up to the left shoulder, that's Kerr's sign. And that's an indication of a ruptured spleen. And you know, the spleen ruptures come in grades, okay? Um, grades one, two, three, and four. And of course, you know, if four, it would be the more serious. So, and when you check your bowel sounds, listen to make sure you check all four quads because absent bowel sounds can mean um, possibly that there's some injury there or some bleeding in the abdomen. Uh, anything, or it can also mean that they have um, um, an ileus. And with the abdominal trauma, you can also get diaphragmatic trauma. So your diaphragm can be ruptured and you could hear bowel sounds up in the chest. Free air in the abdomen would be in, indicated on an x-ray, which also is a disruption to the GI, GI tract. So a lot of times, not only just trauma, but sometimes you can get a lot of fluid in the abdomen, and uh, that can cause you to have uh, problems there. So also um, you can get patients that have abdominal compartment syndrome, and this is where there's pressure in the abdomen. And this pressure in the ab abdominal cavity is greater than the pressure in the capillaries. Um, uh, many a times I see patients that have uh, compartment syndrome from uh, problems with their liver. You have cirrhosis, patients with cirrhosis of the liver, and a lot of times that's where I see it mostly in medical, but you also can have um, intra-abdominal bleeding. And it tells you here that the abdominal perfusion pressure, which is APP, is the difference between the MAP and the intra-abdominal pressure. And the more higher the pressure, then mortality increases, more apt for you to, um, you know, not be able to live because I'm honestly, if you have serious injury to the abdomen, it can cause some real problems. Uh, I always tell people be careful with your peg tubes. Make sure you're not manipulating them too much. Uh, I got a patient the other day whose peg tube was sitting straight up and I'm kind of like, I haven't had a peg tube like this before. It's that it I couldn't get it to, to kind of lay down so that I could put the uh, securement device on it. And so I let the team know and sure enough, the um, peg tube, this is right after surgery, was in the bowel, had perforated the bowel. And so it's real important to, to assess your patient when you get your patient back, especially when they go for surgery, they come back with a peg tube, make sure you're assessing your abdomen well. Um, this says um, intra-abdominal pressure sustained at greater than 20 millimeters of mercury is associated with organ failure or organ dysfunction or failure. And many a times when patients become septic, you will find that they go into multi-system organ failure and the abdomen starts to shut down. You start to lose blood flow to the abdomen. And it not only affects the abdomen when you have compartment syndrome, it will also affect the other organs that are close to it. And GI bleed, many of us have dealt with GI bleeders. Um, if you work, especially in the emergency room, you will get patients that's coming in and they're bleeding heavily. Um, and you find this a lot in your ETOH patients or patients that use a lot of aspirins and Tylenols. And 80% of most bleeds are caused from peptic ulcer disease. So you have to be careful. It tells you on a bottle of Tylenol about using too much Tylenol. Um, uh, really be careful of that. And many a times when these patients come in, especially ETOH, they may have esophageal varices. Uh, that goes along with it. And that's from the alcohol, the use of the alcohol going from the mouth all the way down into the stomach. And it can cause tears in the abdomen and also stress. So, you know, it's real important as nurses, you know, we could be in stressful situations that you really try to remain calm and know that everything would be okay and uh, <laughs> try not to uh, get too excited about anything. 
Uh, one another, one of the tears is real common is the Mallory Wise tear. You may see that on your test. So just know that that's just one of the things that can occur. Lower GI bleeds only account for about 20%. And they result from you have diverticulitis or maybe people that are receiving radiation or have a history of colitis or some type of anti-inflammatory anti disease, Crohn's is one of the real common ones. Um, you see people with C. diff, which is real common, and they will have sometimes lower GI bleed or some irritation in the lower colon. Of course, we know that we use isotonic fluids when we're doing fluid replacement and, of course, use our blood products. And you know you have to be careful in giving blood products. So if this patient's coming in with this massive GI bleed, you still yet have to be careful of how fast you're resuscitating that patient. Some can be have heart failure. And so, and that's real common here. And I know that when you work in a Grady, you find a lot of patients because by patient population, they have heart failure. You have to be really careful in resuscitating these patients. You really do. Even though they need the blood, we know they need the blood, you still yet have to know, are we are we giving them too much fluid? Are we over fluidizing them? Okay. And so I know that um, Ms. Barbara, she'll talk to you all about stroke volume variants and the need for fluids, but we have to be careful with our GI bleeds. And so we know that we would give packed red blood cells, FFPs and platelets if needed. And then sometimes your ammonia level is high and we know that we give lactulose and nurses hate to see that order when you have to give lactulose, but we, we really do need to make sure that we clear that bowel and get that patient's acid base back to uh, normal. Bowel obstructions are real common. Um, patients have paralytic ileuses uh, and those occur, like I say, in you know, the anatomy of the bowel in the small and the large bowel. Peritonitis is real common for some people that um, <clears throat> especially your E2H, and that's just a real common thing that you find. Abdominal surgeries, patients that uh, have diverticulitis and some cancer. And so what you do is you really treat the problem for what it is and um, pain control. Real important for pain control. People with abdominal problems, a lot of times they may not be able to take anything PO, so you got to make sure you coordinate with the physician that you have... Um, IV pain medication and keeping the patient's pain under control. And they may present with real sharp episodic pain and projectile vomiting. A lot of times we know that when we see that, when you learn that in school, that one of the first things that you learn is to monitor people that have this projectile vomiting because we know that there has to be some type of obstruction somewhere. And you'll have high pitched bowel sounds and they'll tell you that their bowel habits have changed. They may not be having bowel movements as often as they normally would. And a lot of times we do place NG tubes to help relieve the ileus and help relieve that pressure out of the abdomen. The bowel is um, really, really a sensitive organ. And we know that because a lot of times we ourselves will say, oh, I ate something wrong. And we have to be really aware of that, um, that it's not something else. Okay. And many a times for bowel obstructions, they treat um, making sure that your patient is getting oxygenated well, making sure that. Um, they um, are stable because when you start to treat a patient, you wanna make sure that you know you, you do the first things first. You gotta make sure they have plenty of air, that they're breathing well, their vital signs as best as possible to get those stabilized. And then we'll start doing everything else. Like I said, placing the NG tube, managing the pain. And if, if they're able to have nutritional support, they can, but most of the time not. You usually do PPN or TPN for these patients and they may need surgery. They might need a, um, um, small bowel repair, because like I said, the patient the other day whose peg was placed incorrectly uh, had a perforation. And it was just a good thing that we noticed that that uh, peg tube was just looking funny. It, I said, I have never seen a peg tube sit straight up in the abdomen like that. So be aware, and this comes with time. You won't, you were not able to learn everything and know everything right away. And as you study for your CCRN, you will find that you think different. You'll start looking at things a little different. And that's what I always say to a nurse. When you get your CCR, and I didn't take mine for 20 years after being a nurse, because I just didn't think I was worthy because I said I needed to know more. And I had to think different. Once I got it, I start looking at different things. So you'll start looking at things different. Okay, so bowel infarc infarctions and perforations, which I just mentioned. And a lot of times, you know, you have to go to surgery for that. Um, that's, just, that's just all there is to it. If you have a thrombus there, they have to go in and remove that. 
um, open the abdomen. You'll see different drains. When the patient comes back from surgery, you may have a JP drain. You may have a Penrose drain. Uh, sometimes they, I don't know how much they do it now because I don't get a lot of surgical patients anymore, but they would have bands that they would have the abdomen partially open and they would pack the wound. So I, like I said, I haven't seen that lately, but I know we used to do that a lot so that the bowel can heal from the inside out. Um, and patients that complain of abdominal pain, I take it serious, even, you know, with yourself, if you keep having this, this pain in your abdomen, get it checked out. I know we, we get a, nurses, we're high stress people and we do a lot, but sometimes you have to take care of yourself. Um, and if some people, ha I have seen several patients in my career with a necrotic bowel, and uh, many of those patients did not survive. They did not make it because, you know, you, you need your bowel. And once that infection sets in, it's kind of hard to reverse. So then we want to talk about liver failure, real common, real common for you all that work in the ECC. Like I said, you get a lot of patients that live right around Brady, E2As, drug abuse. You have a population, a patient population uh, here that, and you all know that. So when you go to assess these patients, you got to make sure that you're checking their in liver enzymes, their pancreas, you know, checking everything because you know that they're, if they're substance abuse, that they really are going to have some issues, some problems. So chronic liver failure normally comes from alcohol abuse. And you want to monitor the labs for the elevated ASTs, bilirumin. And of course, you know, at that point, if the liver is affected, they're going to have poor clotting times. Okay, so you're going to make sure that you want to make sure your PTT, INR, and checking that. It's real important as a nurse to make sure you check your labs daily. When you're giving bedside report and they, someone tells you this patient is here for liver failure, one thing you want to do is, well, what's the labs? I want to see what my, you know, prothrombin time is, my PTT, my INR. Is this patient going to need blood? Am I have to watch for bleeding? Or are they having any bleeding episodes? Okay, so I haven't seen a TIPS procedure done. In, in a while, and like I said, I haven't done surgery, um, had any surgical patients in, in a while. Uh, we try to separate them now. So um, a lot of times they do this procedure to relieve varices. And like I said, many a times when you have ETOH abuse, you'll see that they'll have esophageal varices and sometimes they band those, okay? They can go in and they can put bands on those to stop the bleeding and they kind of work their way down, okay? So uh, you'll have patients with encephalopathy, hepatic encephalopathy, which you'll find that patient to be confused. And, and, and you'll watch as time goes on. So the patient may come in and um, they don't seem to be too bad. They seem like their mentation is pretty good. And as the days go on, you monitor the ammonia level, monitor their uh, liver enzymes and to see you know, how they're flowing. Are they elevating? Are they trending up? Or are they trending down? And you'll start to note the mentation it starts to change when they get encephalopic. Okay, so I just tell you, being, being an observant nurse, checking everything, and no question is a stupid question. Uh, I think it's real important to know that as a nurse, you, and you ask. I'm one of those, I still ask. I don't know everything. I come to work every day. I don't know everything. I just want to learn. I want to know, you know, and it's okay to, to get with somebody and talk about it. All right, so I was talking about the mentation. They can be confused. And of course, you know, you will see some jaundice in these patients that have liver failure, okay? Especially the sclera, one of the most obvious signs, look at the eyes uh, and you can see that. And sometimes, you know, depending on their skin color, you may be able to see it in their skin and the ashen dry looking. Um, this is just, just a problem when this, the liver, when the liver's failing, poor thing. <laughs> Okay, so you'll have patients that come in that are malnourished and um, they have malabsorption and sometimes they're missing certain vitamins. You know, as the elderly, as they get older, and especially if they're living alone, they're not eating properly. Uh, and so many, many a times we'll start internal, in, uh, internal nutrition. And most of the time you all know that as TPN or sometimes just the tube feeds. Be, always check with dietary to make sure that they're getting enough calories that we're using the proper tube feeds um, so that we can make sure that they are getting what, what they need. And we need to feed as soon as possible. They're getting to the point now, even patients going to surgery are not MPO all the time at midnight, sometimes just four hours prior to going to surgery, depending on what type of surgery that they're gonna have. Also make sure that you have proper placement uh, of your um, 
Dobhoff tubes. And so now I think hospital wide, we're only putting them in from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Is everybody aware of that? Okay, so I know for us in the ICU, that's what we're doing. And I believe that's hospital wide uh, because uh, those weighted Dobhoffs can cause um, perforations. Okay, and especially in, in the lungs. So just check with your leaders to see if you all are practicing that, but I think that you are because any emergency uh, after five, you know, we're limited on radiologists and so forth. And that's, that's okay because you wanna make sure that your patient is safe and that you're safe and you don't want them to be bleeding or, or have a lung perforation while you're trying to get a read on your placement. Monitor if the patient's not tolerating the two feet, if you notice them to uh, have uh, frequent liquid bowel movements or they start vomiting and then check their abdomen for softness, make sure it's not firm, elevate the head of the bed, you know, 30 degrees, make sure that they're, they're properly situated when they receive these feeds, make sure your NG tube is secured. And if you are doing TPN, check the check is double checked by two nurses at night. Make sure it's ordered in at a decent time so that you can get it. I know a practice for us, and it's not a policy on it, but if for some reason that TPN is missed, we hang D10 in the ICU so that we can make sure their blood sugars stay up. And we do use parental nutrition. And many a times that they, they some people say, well, we should have a pick line for that. You don't have to. A midline will work if you use that just for your parental nutrition, um, because a lot of times with a pick line, if it does become infective, then you have a collapse. So they go ahead and I know they're using more midlines for PPN now. All right, the pancreas. Most uh, One thing about the pancreas, we relate it more so to diabetes. People, uh, diabetics, you know, not being able to secrete insulin or uh, not putting not putting out enough insulin, so we have to give them insulin. Acute pancreatitis, that's inflammation, and it totally destroys the um, the the pancreas. Uh, well, not totally, but it has a, a high effect on how it can function. And fluid is sometimes secreted into the interstitial space, and that is re results to serves. So, and that's just an inflammatory response. And that's something you wanna know because I'm sure that that will pop up on the test. Know about your SIRS. You have something? Yeah, SIRS is no longer in terms of Okay. So this-, this Anti-inflammatory. Okay. Yeah, all righty. All righty. So many causes of pancreatitis, just like liver failures, ETOH, gallstones, and drugs, certain IV drugs will cause problems with- uh, your pancreas. And I think it's real important to, to monitor when we are giving patients drugs here, we think it's okay when we're using fentanyl and propofol because, you know, this patient needs to be sedated, this patient's intubated. And I say this because, you know, being in the ICU, I think that uh, we really need to be careful, especially with our elderly patients who are not used to getting these types of drugs, that it's real important that we're not over sedating these patients or giving them too much because they're, as we age, our, our uh, organs decrease in their function. And so you don't wanna get these little people uh, too sedated. And we did talk about Cullen signs about the ecchymosis around the umbilicus. Many times for pancreatitis, you're gonna get fluids, calcium and vitamin K, mag replacements, you're gonna make sure that all their electrolytes are in place and uh, control the pain. Pain control is real important, okay? Spleen, splenectomy. I have seen multiple people come in from uh, motor vehicle crashes and had to have their spleen removed and or either it's ruptured. And that's, the, that's where the pain will radiate from the abdomen to the left shoulder. And that's the Kerr sign. And sometimes you will have a diaphragmatic um, irritation or injury and that's referred pain. And rupture can occur from trauma. We've talked about that already. So just know how did this uh, how did this occur? Was it from an accident? Was it from blunt trauma, uh, or was it a gunshot wound? Just be aware of how the spleen was ruptured and it comes it's graded as to the injury, the type of injury, how serious the injury is. All right, that's basically all I have. And it, like I said, it's only six percent on the CCRN. So I think that once you kind of know those signs that you will, you'll be good. You'll be good. I'm glad I could help Barb. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. And you're welcome. You're welcome. Right, so okay.
Yeah. And that would be kidney failure. Thank you so You're much. So Sorry for the mix up, but we have a little issues because of using all this different system. Pardon me? Oh, that's good. All right. Uh, so, Rach, I might need a little help. Just, I, I think I've got it now with the Grady thing, but I want to just be sure. So, guys, I'm just going to move over to my slides, which I have to actually open from my email. So, we're just going to check to make sure that I've got this capability. And uh, I actually don't think it has anything to do with age. I think it has to do with the fact that I don't use PC. I use my Mac. Okay, so up here, yep, okay, good. And go to Outlook. Just gonna open up my slides, my friends. You've got the handout. So I wanna reiterate a couple of things that, um, uh, that Dr. said, and really, really important for us to appreciate. There will be a question about Collins or Gray Turner. So you need to know that typically when the question is about Collins or Gray Turner, they're actually asking you about pancreatitis. And that is almost always the question on GI is about those signs and symptoms. Okay. All right, my friends. So there we go. Fantastic. All right. Very good. So now we're going to talk about renal. And the very most important thing to think about when we're talking about kidney failure, and especially as it relates to your clinical practice, but also as it relates to your CCRN exam, is to really appreciate the things you know about the kidney, that it filters the blood, regulates your electrolytes, particularly sodium and potassium. And those are major regulations of the kidney. So someone else will need to take care of the door now that I'm down here. Also a very significant control over blood pressure and the control over blood pressure is mediated through what's known as the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So just like we talk about RAS for sedation, we also talk about RAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system when we're talking about the kidney hormone, which is actually about A, blood pressure control and B, salt and water reabsorption. Angiotensin is about blood pressure control. Aldosterone is about salt and water reabsorption. We're gonna talk a little more about that. But one of the most important things to remember about the kidney is the kidney is responsible for the excretion of the metabolic acid hydrogen. So you must have functional kidneys to excrete metabolic acid. And that is a major component of kidney function. The metabolic acid is hydrogen. Hydrogen, potassium exchange equally. When you have kidney failure, when you have good kidneys, you'll excrete hydrogen in metabolic acidosis and retain potassium. So patients with metabolic acidosis typically will have a little bit higher potassium because the kidney is trying to regulate the acid excretes the acid, hydrogen, retains the potassium. But when you have kidney failure, you don't excrete hydrogen and you don't excrete potassium. So one thing I wanna make sure you know in your clinical practice and you understand on the exam, if you have hyperkalemia, always look to the possibility of acidosis, metabolic acidosis. Now remember the metabolic acid is hydrogen. When hydrogen goes up, bicarb or base, or they'll offer both on your question, but in your practice, you're gonna look at the base, base goes down. When hydrogen, metabolic acid goes up, base goes down, bicarb goes down. So base and bicarb down, hydrogen is up. If I'm evaluating somebody's kidney function and I say, oh, potassium is up, I'm immediately gonna look at their bicarb and their base. And my expectation in renal failure, high potassium, high metabolic acid, which I don't look at, but I evaluate that high metabolic acid by looking at the base and bicarb. So base and bicarb down, potassium up. Okay, I'm gonna remember this. Now I'm gonna look at your creatinine and your BUN and your urine output. That's what's gonna help me evaluate the kidney. Remember the kidney is responsible for the excretion of metabolic acid. 
other things the kidney does. And we're much more worried about this when we talk about chronic renal failure is the kidney releases the hormone erythropoietin. Erythropoietin stimulates the manufacturing of red blood cells. So our expectation in chronic renal failure states is chronic renal failure patients are typically anemic. So they have a low hemoglobin. Now, chronic renal failure patients will generally receive an epigen injection. And the epigen injection actually mimics the hormone that the kidney is no longer producing because you have chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease. And we're going to replace that with epigen. We don't do that acutely. But if I admit a patient who has acute kidney injury on top of chronic kidney disease. What that means is they are hypoperfused. So they have acute kidney injury on top of chronic kidney disease. You need to be acutely aware that those patients are typically on epigen outside the hospital. You need to be sure that they're getting it in the hospital. Because remember what the role of the red blood cell is to carry oxygen. So I've got a hypoperfused patient who's anemic, who has heart failure and renal failure. They're gonna die if you're not paying attention. Good? Feel good about what I've said? All right, very good. The other thing is that the kidney helps to regulate and convert corticosteroids, and that promotes the making of glucose from non-glucose products. That's called gluconeogenesis. So the kidney participates with the adrenal gland in uh, activating your corticosteroid. Really important to remember with acute kidney injury, with chronic kidney injury, and if you have kidney and liver failure, your patient will be hypoglycemic because they are not able to make glucose effectively available. So it's not unusual to see a person who is being dialyzed had a high blood glucose and now they're hypoglycemic because as you dialyze them, you're removing the excess glucose, but they can't make any more glucose available. So very, very important for us to remember that. The other aspect of the kidney is to actually convert vitamin D to its active form, that's calcitrol. And that's what actually promotes calcium absorption in the bone. And so we know that patients who have Again, we're not worrying about this with acute kidney injury, but with acute on chronic or chronic renal failure, you actually see that individuals actually have brittle bones. They're very likely to break bones, have falls, break their hip. So we're always aware of that as well when we're talking about our patients. Now, I like to make sure we remember the anatomy of the kidney. Of course, everybody knows you got two kidneys and within those two kidneys, you have 2 million nephrons. Nephrons are the functional unit of the kidney, and it's really important for us to understand the nephron because that helps us to understand the kind of renal conditions that occur under our care. Okay, so first and foremost, we talk about the glomerulus, which is the filter of the kidney. The filter of the kidney is driven by volume and pressure. The filter of the kidney is driven by volume and pressure. So this always happens. All right, my friends, I'm just gonna keep talking. You know that you're gonna get your visual back up in just one second. Uh, the classroom, the people on the virtual, they have their visual. Everybody in the classroom, it'll come right back up, but I'm gonna keep talking. So 2 million nephrons, every nephron has a glomerulus and the glomerulus is a high efficiency filter driven by volume and pressure. Now, all volume is not the same, correct? Your patient can have venous volume, but not arterial volume. Your patient can have interstitial volume, but not arterial volume. So really important to remember, we're talking about arterial volume. That means that you actually have a good cardiac output and or a good stroke volume. You've got to have good cardiac output and good stroke volume, okay? You also have to be able to maintain a mean arterial pressure. Now on your test, the mean arterial pressure that everyone's gonna talk about is 65. 
But when we are actually recruiting the kidney or trying to protect the kidney, we're gonna need a higher mean arterial pressure. So that's for your clinical practice, okay? For your clinical practice, it's gonna be really, really, really important. So it's shutting down again. I don't know why, it's kind of crazy. That's okay. You can see this right here, the screen's not down, the system's shutting off again. I'm gonna let it go to sleep and come back up. Okay, cause it, uh, it was saying that it was shutting down. I can, I can touch it again to begin now. You want me to go ahead? All right, very good, thank you. So guys, just kind of look at your bifurcated visual. There's not really that explanatory. Remember the glomerulus, the filter of the kidney is driven by volume and pressure. The tubules of the kidney are actually driven primarily by oxygenated blood flow. Okay, so glomerulus is affected when your volume is poor, when your pressure is poor, and we're talking about arterial volume, arterial pressure, you're gonna affect your glomerulus. But if you don't have adequate blood flow to the glomerulus, that's also gonna affect the oxygenation of the tubes. So what happens first is we get a recognition that you have poor blood flow to the glomerulus, that's called pre-renal failure, and you will eventually infarct your tubules. Okay, you're gonna fix it? All right, love, thank you. So really, really important for us to appreciate that. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. It's not even on the slide, it's just me talking. But in order for that to happen, you are delivering a lot of volume to the kidney. A lot of blood volume gets delivered to the kidney. 25% of your cardiac output, which is stroke volume times heart rate, 25% of your cardiac output is processed in the kidney. 25%. So that's every minute you are processing 25%. That's usually about 1,200 mLs of volume. So whenever your patient has arterial hypovolemia, they're in hypovolemic shock, they're in hemorrhagic shock, they're in cardiogenic shock, or they are vasodilated, kidney is at risk. That means every day in critical care, your kidney is at risk. And it's a really important concept for us to appreciate. Okay, so I'm going to divide the kidney further into two parts, the cortex and the medulla. The cortex is where primarily where your glomerulus resides. And the exiting tubule from the glomerulus, that's called the proximal tubule, and the distal tubule, tubule far from the glomerulus, that all resides in the cortex. Remember, cortex is primarily driven by blood volume and blood pressure. In the middle of the kidney, this is where we find what's known as the renal pyramids, this is where the loop of Henle is, and the loop of Henle is profoundly oxygen dependent. Most of the diuretics that we use affect the loop of Henle, okay? So things like Lasix and Metolazine, all Bumex affect the loop of Henle because at the loop of Henle, what happens is you block all of your electrolyte reabsorption into the blood, and then that means that those electrolytes, particularly sodium, is going to pull fluid with it. And when you give a diuretic, you're going to waste electrolytes and you're going to waste volume. And that's the goal of diuretic therapy, particularly when we talk about loop diuretics. Okay, there are other diuretics that we might use at the proximal tubule, at the distal tubule, but in general, our diuretics are affecting the loop of Henle, which is profoundly oxygen dependent. So having said that, you could say, oh, maybe that's why my attending physician or my nephrologist early on in acute kidney injury order Lasix. They may not be actually expecting necessarily that you're going to get a lot of urine output. What they're trying to do is protect the loop of Henle from ischemia, because when you give a loop diuretic, you decrease the oxygen consumption of the kidney. So that actually then improves overall kidney function. Okay, friends. All right. So now we just take a quick look at that nephron and we're looking at the glomerulus. The glomerulus is where all your blood enters under pressure, the volume of your arterial blood into that network of capillaries. It's a very high efficiency filter. So blood enters and it pushes, pushes, pushes across that high efficiency filter, which is the capillary membrane. And whatever is pushed out of the blood is captured in the bowl 
of the Bowman's capsule, which is what you see here. The Bowman's capsule collects everything that was pushed out of the blood. So it's really important to remember blood enters dirty, dilute, electrolyte rich, and oxygenated when your blood enters here. Push, 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 push. You push out the dirt. That's the metabolic waste, the majority of it. You push out the majority of your electrolytes. You push out your water. And that all gets captured in the bowl of the Bowman's capsule. That's now going to be called filtrate. And at the bottom of the bowl, there's a hose. And where that hose goes, no one knows. No, we actually do know. The hose, which is the proximal tubule, goes down into the middle of the kidney. Now, the hose is carrying what's been filtered, but I need a lot of that back. I need my electrolytes back. I need some water back. So my capillaries actually entwine with the tubules and the blood reabsorbs. We call that tubular reabsorption. The blood reabsorbs that which it needs, electrolytes and water. And the final perfection of the blood, which is excretion of other products that we don't want is known as tubular secretion. When we say tubular reabsorption, we talk about what is coming back into the blood. And when we talk about tubular secretion, we're talking about what the blood is passing into the tubule. Okay, so tubular reabsorption, tubular secretion are about the blood filtrate interface in the middle of the kidney. And because we're gonna reabsorb electrolytes against current, meaning the sodium in the blood is 70, the sodium in the filtrate is 70, we're gonna reabsorb sodium against the current because there's equality, I have to use oxygen. That's why that's an oxygen dependent surface, okay? So really, really important for us to appreciate that. All right. So this gives rise to the visual of the peritubular capillaries. That's what's going to reabsorb. So now we're just going to remind ourselves because these will may be some terms that are used uh, on your exam. And it's really important for us to remember is the uh, blood vessel that enters into the glomerulus that enters from the aorta side. That's called the afferent arterial. Okay, that afferent arterial is a bigger vessel to allow a lot of blood volume to come into the filter. And the blood that exits from the glomerulus is called the efferent, very lovely. Afferent, aortic side, efferent, exit. On either side, that blood is oxygenated because I haven't used any oxygen in my filter. I'm just pushing by hydrostatic pressure. I'm just pushing by diffusion, which is the way solutes move. Really important. And the afferent arterial acts like an artery that is dilated and it responds to the hormone that is released there. That hormone, which starts off as renin, ultimately converted to angiotensin, promotes vasoconstriction, most particularly on the afferent side. Okay. So we know that when we have patients who are in a constant state of poor arterial volume, so their arterial volume is poor, but if it's because they have heart failure, which means they've got volume, but it's in the wrong place, they're going to release renin, which converts to angiotensin and stimulates aldosterone, which means they will vasoconstrict, they will absorb more salt and water, and that will make their heart failure worse. That's why those patients are placed on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors actually block that kidney response at that renin angiotensin axis, or actually blocks the conversion of angiotensin one to angiotensin two, that occurs in the lungs. So I wanna make sure you appreciate you have poor arterial volume, but high venous volume and high interstitial volume, you've got heart failure. When you have heart failure, your kidney in its normal response is gonna make your heart failure worse. Your heart failure gets worse, your kidney failure gets worse. Your kidney failure gets worse, your heart failure gets worse. Now you've got lung failure because you have pulmonary edema. 
Now you have cerebral edema. Now you have gastric edema and abdominal compartment syndrome, all because of this mechanism that starts off, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, okay? All right, very good. All right, so just again, remember about 20 to 25% of the cardiac output is actually processed through the kidney. Lots of cardiac output. The only, only organ that receives all the cardiac output all the time is the lung. No other organ receives all the cardiac output, but after the lung, the kidney is the one that receives the most cardiac output because I've got to flow blood through the kidney to clean. I got to clean those waste products, BUN, creatinine, insulin, glucose, I've got to regulate my electrolytes, sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. And I have to control my water. That's what my kidney is going to do. And it does that through that processing. Sorry, I showed that again. Okay, so I always like to just remind you that failure of volume or pressure is going to be considered pre-renal failure. That means the problem is before the kidney, pre-renal. When we see that patient, one of the first things we're going to see with that patient is that their BUN is going to go up extraordinarily high. The creatinine goes up mildly, but the BUN goes up aggressively. Because they have less volume going through the kidney, their urine output is going to go down. But what's really important for you to remember is the process that the glomerulus is to push that water into the tubes, but it is the process of the tubes that, thank you, that actually controls um, concentration or dilution of the urine. So pre-renal glomerular is about making urine. Tubules are about dilution, or contraction, concentration of the urine. So I go to your bedside, you're barely making any urine. I send the urine to the lab and that urine is concentrated. That tells me you still have tubular function. It's the amount of urine that tells me about the glomerulus. It's the concentration or dilution that tells me about your tubules. And that's really important because when you look at kidney function and kidney failure, you want to be able to appreciate that. So again, glomerulus depends on volume and pressure and it's filtration, 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 pre-renal failure, hypovolemia, hemorrhage, vasodilation, cardiac shock, failure of volume and pressure, pre-renal first, and then you infarct your tubules. Pre-renal failure, and then acute tubular necrosis because you've infarcted your tubules. So what I want you to remember, when we're looking at pre-renal failure, that is renal angina. Okay, patient comes into the emergency room, 10 out of 10 chest pain, troponin's high, ST segment elevation on the EKG, what are they gonna do? They're gonna go to the cath lab. Patient comes to your unit with indications of pre-renal failure. BUN is up, urine output's down, it's concentrated. Deregulation of their ions. What do you do? Most of the time you're barely even collecting the urine output to, to tell every hour an accurate urine output. And then that patient progresses into acute tubular necrosis. And now they've infarcted their kidney. So from a clinical practice standpoint, one of the most important things you do is evaluate the urine output every hour and look at it over an eight hour, 12 hour, 24 hour period of time. And when urine output starts to decrease, remember that's a canary that's telling you, you are actually putting your kidney at risk. Once your kidney is at risk, your heart's gonna be at risk. If you didn't come in with heart failure, you're gonna end up with heart failure. And this is something we can actually affect pretty significantly if we are really watching our patients and really trying to be uh, aware of what's going on for those patients. Okay, great. All right, remember when blood flow or blood pressure is low to the kidney, the first thing that happens, and that's, there's always a question about this, is there's a little receptor primarily in the afferent arterial. That receptor is called the JG apparatus, JGA, juxtoglomerular apparatus next to the glomerulus, JGA, and that's what releases renin. Renin travels in the blood to the liver where it is processed and turned into angiotensin 1. That blood then travels to the lung where it's processed and it becomes angiotensin II. 
without angiotensin, you will have a lot of trouble controlling your blood pressure. So that's very important. Which one? JJG apparatus, the juxtoglomerular, and it's always referred to as JGA. And on an exam, they'll spell it out and they'll also give you JGA. The JGA is a receptor site. That receptor, when it senses low volume or low pressure, that receptor releases renin. That's the hormone, renin. Renin partners with the liver enzyme. The liver enzyme is, nobody's going to ask you that and you're not measuring it. So the liver enzyme is angiotensinogen. But by the way, you have to have a functional liver. So you got to have a functional kidney and a functional liver. Renin partnered with angiotensinogen, which is the liver hormone, becomes angiotensin 1, which travels in the blood to the lung. And the lung will convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So by the way, for you to have a normal response to renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone, number one, you have to have a functional apparatus at the kidney. You have to have a functional liver. And you have to have a functional lung. That seems like a really fragile system. And failure of any one of those organs is going to alter this renin, angiotensin, aldosterone axis. Okay. Okay, so that's that JG apparatus that's referred to in your handout. And that JG apparatus primarily resides in the afferent arteriole, and it's what helps to control the volume and pressure processing that's occurring in the kidney. Okay, so this is just a little schema to remind us here that when you actually have low blood volume and low blood pressure and or you're gonna have a stimulation from the kidney to release renin, which converts ultimately into angiotensin II. Angiotensin II, our natural hormone, angiotensin II, is the most profound vasoconstrictor known to man. So an immediate response to that angiotensin II is to vasoconstrict, which means the arteries and a little bit the veins, but mostly the arteries are gonna vasoconstrict. That's gonna drive up their systemic vascular resistance and their arterial pressure. That will increase the blood pressure. I'm not gonna increase the blood volume. It's gonna increase the blood pressure, which hopefully will restore a pressure gradient that forces filtering at the glomerulus, okay? But the other thing that happens is that that release of Brennan stimulates aldosterone and aldosterone is going to increase sodium and water retention. That's going to increase your blood volume and your cardiac output. So at the same time, the renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone uh, release vasoconstricts the arteries, increases your blood volume. That should increase your cardiac output and you have restoration of volume and pressure. But the essential ingredient here is that the heart has to be able to accept that volume and move it. So if you're already in heart failure, that's gonna make you much worse. Remember, if you're in heart failure, a lot of that volume stays in the heart, the atria stretches, the atria releases a hormone that you measure. That hormone is BNP, beta natriuretic peptide hormone. So when we are looking at heart failure, we always look at a BNP. BNP should always be less than 100, anything greater than 200, indicates heart failure. And when we're talking about this process, what you will frequently see is I'm releasing that hormone now from the atria of my heart because I've had kidney failure and I'm not excreting volume, but I've got a lot of volume on board. So my patient releases that beta natriuretic peptide hormone, okay? Some other things that happen in the adrenal gland, of course, is on top of the renal, uh, the renal organ and the adrenal gland is what releases aldosterone. The brain is also going to release the hormone antidiuretic, also known as vasopressin. So you basically have three primary hormones that are released in order to control volume and pressure in the kidney, ADH, aldosterone, and renin, which ultimately converts to angiotensin II. The heart itself is going to try to promote diuresis and the heart will promote diuresis by releasing beta-natriuretic 
peptide hormone. Okay, so first step in your information, free renal dependent is the filter, and that's glomerular failure of volume and pressure to the kidney causes pre-renal dysfunction. In the tubules, we reabsorb from the filtrate that which we want. We secrete from the blood that which we don't. It's very straightforward. I found myself that when I was in nursing school, uh, and I was already really a physiologist, I always found it rather difficult to appreciate what tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion meant, but what it actually means. Tubular reabsorption from the filtrate back into the blood. Tubular secretion from the blood into the filtrate. So my blood is secreting that which it doesn't want. My blood is reabsorbing that which is what I want. Because you process your total blood volume, you have to reabsorb that. You can't, you can't release all your blood volume through your kidney because then you'll be dead. You'll be, high, you'll be in hypovolemic shock and you'll be dead. 98% of what's been filtered in terms of water, 98% of that is reabsorbed. That's how you maintain your water balancing, okay? Now, really, really, really important to remember that reabsorption, reabsorption, which means my blood takes back that which it needs from the filtrate is incredibly more important than secretion. Secretion is kind of the minor perfecting of the blood, but if I cannot reabsorb from my tubules, I'm gonna have a deregulation of my ions, my electrolytes and my water, okay? All right, so we just take a quick look at that. I don't really think they're ever gonna ask these questions anymore. They used to ask, okay. Okay, in the proximal tubule, the one closest to the glomerulus, this is where you actually reabsorb the majority of water and the majority of sodium, okay? In the proximal tubule. Proximal tubule doesn't really, uh, we don't really significantly affect the proximal tubule with antidiuretics, but it, it or prodiuresis, uh, but it is possible. That's not really the agents that we use. Mostly we use agents that work at the loop of Henley. In the loop of Henley, 20% of your sodium, your chloride, your potassium are reabsorbed and your other ions. So all ions at the loop of Henley all ions, sodium, potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, and calcium are reabsorbed into the blood from the filtrate with the power of oxygen. Okay, now on the right-hand side of your slide, I'm showing you what's called countercurrent mechanism. Don't worry about that. Just know the term countercurrent means that I've got to use oxygen because I'm moving ions against the current. Current means equality across both sides. If I need to reabsorb more potassium or more sodium, I'm gonna take it from the filtrate and put it back into my blood, okay? That's really important. Okay, the distal tubule is the final place where you're perfecting your patient's blood flow or you're perfecting your patient's blood content. And primarily what happens in the distal tubule is the regulation of bicarbonate and secretion of potassium, okay? So I want to go back here. I'm going to review this one more time. When I use a loop diuretic, and the primary one would be Lasix, Metolazine, Bumex, loop diuretics. When I'm using loop diuretics, I'm going to block the reabsorption of sodium, which also means I'm blocking the reabsorption of all my other electrolytes and the reabsorption of water. So when I give you a loop diuretic, you're gonna waste more salt, more potassium, more other electrolytes in small process and more water. That's what a loop diuretic does, okay? When we talk about a distal tubule diuretic, a distal tubule diuretic, all diuretics work by wasting sodium. So when I use a distal tubule diuretic, I block, potassium from being wasted. So this is where you're secreting potassium from the blood into the filtrate, but I'm gonna use a potassium sparing diuretic, which means I'm gonna retain potassium in my blood, I'm gonna waste a little more salt. And when I waste a little more sodium, here in the distal tubule, it's gonna be sodium and water, not all the other electrolytes. Okay, so 
What that tells you, your purpose on an exam is you're giving a loop diuretic, you're gonna anticipate. The most important thing is wasting of sodium, wasting of potassium, and the wasting of water, which is the number one problem with loop diuretics, not the wasting of sodium, not the wasting of water, the wasting of potassium. Because now my patient's potassium level has dropped. Now they've got to take potassium or you have to give potassium because you're giving them a loop diuretic. So frequently we're going to marry the loop diuretic with the potassium sparing diuretic. Loop diuretic works at the loop. That's going to be Lasix. That's going to be the most common one. And there's really only one potassium sparing diuretic and that is spirolactone, aldactone, blocking aldosterone so that I reabsorb potassium and I waste sodium. Does that make sense to everyone? You feel pretty good? You feel like that's pretty good understanding. Now, remember, here we are, we're talking about the coordination of the kidney and the heart. We have a critical patient, they're in heart failure. They probably are having some dysrhythmia. We're gonna put them on a potassium blocking agent. And that will be amiodarone, which you're going to use for atrial fib and you're going to use for VTAC, you're going to use for VFib, you use it for everything. You love amiodarone. But in a heart failure patient, amiodarone requires that you have a normal serum potassium. So I'm treating your kidney, I'm giving you Lasix, but I'm not giving you aldactone. I'm giving you potassium replacement, but your potassium is 3.2 or 3.5. That's not good enough. Remember, heart failure patients need a potassium of four or greater because they need a higher level of potassium. And if you're using potassium channel antagonist blocking agents like amiodarone, you have to assure that the patient has a normal potassium level. So your purpose is always to say, oh, look, on an exam question, here's a patient who has heart failure, who has renal failure, who we're giving Lasix to, and now their potassium is 3.2, and you're starting to have some dysrhythmias. You're going to want to replace their potassium, and you're also going to want to add a potassium-sparing diuretic. Now, they're not going to say, what are you going to order as a nurse? But the question is going to be, what should you be anticipating? When you're using Lasix, should you anticipate that your patient's potassium is going to drop? Yes or no? Yes. And in order to improve the outcome for that patient, which they are probably not going to ask you, but what I'm asking you to do is be aware of the outcome of your patient. You need to replace potassium and you need to advocate for a potassium sparing diuretic. Cool? Everybody good? All right, my friends. So final place, remember, here we are. Final place, distal tubule and collecting duct. This is where aldosterone works. And that regulates sodium uptake and potassium excretion. Now, just from an endocrine perspective, not a kidney perspective, sort of from a kidney perspective, what you always expect is that potassium and sodium, when it's renal failure, potassium and sodium should go in opposite directions. So sodium will typically be down because it's dilute in the water and potassium will typically be up. Potassium up, sodium down. That's what we expect in renal failure. Kidney's not excreting potassium, kidney's not excreting sodium, but the kidney is also not excreting water. So sodium is measured in relationship to water. If I don't have renal failure and sodium and potassium are working in opposite directions and I don't have renal failure, that typically tells me I have adrenal insufficiency. So we're gonna talk about endocrinology, but I want you just to understand the relationship of sodium and potassium here. Your kidney is designed to keep your blood perfect. When you have kidney failure, your blood becomes imperfect. And imperfection is measured by the presence of metabolic waste and the deregulation of your electrolytes and water. Right? Okay, excellent, very good. All right, so acute kidney failure, means the loss of renal function, and that can occur over hours or days. Best way for us to measure, the best way to measure is on your chemistry when you get glomerular filtration rate. Now, remember looking at the BUN and the creatinine helped me to spearhead where the problem is in the kidney. If BUN is up greatly and creatinine is up minorly, that's a pre-renal failure. If BUN and creatinine are both up, but they're up in equal proportion, 
that's going to be an acute tubular necrosis. Okay. But the best way for you to evaluate kidney function is to pay attention to GFR on your chemistry panel. Every time you do a chemistry, you get a GFR. GFR normally is about 120. All patients, in order to preserve their kidney, should have a GFR greater than 80. So Rachel took care of Mr. Smith on day one. His GFR was 105. He has expressive or, or uh, exacerbated heart failure. And she goes, she's gone for two days, she comes back. And now Mr. Smith's GFR is 70. Should you be worried? And you're gonna be worried regardless of what the creatinine is because what that is telling you is that their filtering rate is going down. GFR stands for glomerular filtration rate. So 80 to 120. Now, I'm not sure where the AACN is gonna be on this, but historically we have talked about where we accept uh, or, or that uh, persons of African-American descent uh, actually will traditionally have a lower GFR, but that's because the test weighting was geared towards Caucasians. It wasn't really that they had a lower GFR. We're looking, we have to remember that GFR is in relationship to muscle mass and body mass. So when we're looking at percent of muscle that changes our GFR. So in today's world, what I just want you to remember, anybody with a GFR of less than 80 is at risk. Anybody with a GFR of less than 50 is in failure. Anybody, okay? All right. So we don't really say renal failure so much anymore. We talk about acute kidney injury. We talk about acute kidney failure. Renal has kind of been thrown out. It really is about kidney. And there's a particular criteria that we use that you can always look up. That criteria is uh, from the Acute Kidney Injury Network. It's known as the RIFLE criteria. Anybody who's heard me talk about the kidney or come to a CRT class, you know I always say put in RIFLE on your uh, search engine, RIFLE, R-I-F-L-E, for kidney. And that basically says when your GFR is dropped or your creatinine has gone up and your urine output's gone down, it stages the levels of kidney dysfunction. Now, they're not going to ask you to stage your patients. We just want to make sure you know that 50% increase in the admitting creatinine, 50% increase indicates that you have a patient who's at risk. And the higher the increase, the worse the patient is. So just 50% increase tells you you're at risk. If you have 100%, 200%, 300%, or your creatinine is greater than four, you're in kidney failure. So that helps you to understand that. So no one's going to ask you to stage the cr criteria because you can look it up. You don't need to memorize it. The other component of that is GFR. As GFR decreases, your creatinine is also going to increase. As GFR decreases and creatinine increases, you're in kidney failure. So you know that GFR should be greater than 80, and you know that we shouldn't have an increase of more than 30% or so of your baseline creatinine. Okay, that's combined with urine output. Now, what you will need to know is that urine output is a weight-based measure. And you don't, we look at urine every hour because that gives us a sign, but you and I are not making urine every hour. Patients are not gonna make the same amount of urine every hour, even though we're capturing it. So we always look at urine output on the hourly basis, and then we look at it over time with an average, which means, you had 30 cc's one hour, you had 100 cc's the next, you had 10 cc's the following, you had 150 the next. You're gonna add eight hours together, divide by eight, so that you're getting an average of urine per hour. So you're gonna collect urine every hour. That's what you need for your INO and to really understand what's happening for the patient. But when you're actually promoting to your colleagues that you have a patient with kidney dysfunction, it's not based on that one hour. It's based on eight hours or 12 hours or 24 hours. And what you're looking at is the average urine output per hour. So that's why I collect it for eight, divide by eight. That tells me the average urine output per hour. And then I'm gonna divide that by your weight. Adults, and no one's gonna ask you to calculate this, but that's how it's gonna be presented to you. Adults, 
should have a urine output of greater than 0.5 mLs per kg per hour. And it should never be greater unless you've done some aggressive resuscitation or they have diabetes insipidus. Should never be greater than 1.5 mLs per kg per hour. So the range is 0.5 mLs per kg per hour to 1.5 mLs per kg per hour. Anything under than that, you're at risk. Anything over than that, that, you're either overhydrated and you still have good kidney, or you have a hormone dysfunction, the most common one being diabetes insipidus. Okay, so really, really, really important. Now we have lots of symptomatology that's associated with acute kidney injury. Uh, uremic symptoms come from a stimulation particular, comes from some encephalopathy, some from diaphragmatic tickling from the concentration of urea. And remember, when we look at our patient, our expectation is that they're going to have high, high potassium and low sodium. And they will also have a low base and a low bicarb because they're in metabolic acidosis. Now, I want to remind you, I want to remind you that your kidney exchanges hydrogen ion for potassium. So as long as my kidney is functional, that's going to happen. As my kidney becomes dysfunctional, we're not gonna waste hydrogen, we're not gonna waste potassium. So our patient's gonna be acidotic and they're gonna be hyperkalemic. And in the presence of metabolic acidosis, you lose responsiveness to catecholamines, which means your patient will become more and more and more hypotensive and you will not be able to resuscitate them because they're not gonna to respond to epinephrine and norepinephrine, neosinephrine, dopamine for vasoconstriction. From my point of view, that's really up to you. When you're seeing that you've got a patient who has a pH of 7.20 and you've titrated up, you've tripled your norepinephrine or you've tripled your epinephrine, your patient's blood pressure is still low, you've got a very narrow window of opportunity because they are infarcting every single organ while that is happening. It's your responsibility to stop just titrating up and notify your provider that the patient is catecholamine resistant because there's a lot of other things we can do. Yesterday on our Tuesday topic, I talked about refractory hypotension. What should I do? Calcium chloride, bicarbonate, methylene blue, serum cortisol. These are all basic things we, and, and of course, vasopressin and maybe angiotensin. But there are lots of things we can do when patients are refractory to our vasopressors. And if the first thing we say is, are they acidotic? Doesn't matter if it's acidosis from kidney failure. If they are acidotic, they're gonna lose responsiveness. As they lose responsiveness to their vessel, the pressure driving blood flow through the kidney is gonna go down, their kidney failure is gonna get worse. So they started with a 50% increase in creatinine, they're on norepinephrine and epinephrine, they're acidotic minorly, and now that's getting worse and worse and worse, and you're just going up on norepinephrine and epinephrine like that's your only job. And your patient is infarcting their organs. So I'm not saying to you, you're not going to titrate up. I'm going to say you've got to titrate up with knowledge and care. You can't just titrate up and think that's okay. All right, my friends. So when we talk about acute renal failure, that is also a symptom that is generated or measured by rapid reduction renal excretion, most particularly of the stable metabolic waste product. Okay, stable metabolic waste product is creatinine. So we don't really use blood urea nitrogen to tell us if you have kidney injury or kidney failure. We use blood urea nitrogen plus creatinine to try to position where your problem is. But creatinine itself and GFR are what's gonna tell us about our patient's condition. So creatinine, remember, should never increase more than 50%. Creatinine is a steady state substance. The only time creatinine goes up in your blood is if you are lysing muscle, okay? So typically when we talk about your patient is lysing his muscle, you're gonna see byproducts of muscle lysis in the blood and creatinine is gonna go very high. Now the patient's gonna make a lot of urine trying to clear that creatinine because they have good kidney function. The problem is they're lysing muscles. Lysing muscle typically is the term that we use. There's two, the first one is, patient was found down. He had a cardiac arrest. 
He was in a motor vehicle collision. He was pinned under a cement pillar, found down. All that pressure on the muscle promotes muscle lysis. The other term we use for that. So first of all, high creatinine without, in the early stage, high creatinine without renal failure. Second thing, found down. The third thing is rhabdomyolysis, which is the lyse, uh, lysing of muscle. So when we lyse muscles, we're gonna flood the serum with creatinine and the kidney is gonna process and try to push that creatinine out with a lot of urine output. So patients typically are gonna have a very high urine output. The problem is that when you're lysing the muscle, you're releasing the muscle dye into the blood. The muscle dye is iron. Iron is toxic to your kidney. So those patients, typically, when you see them, you're replacing their fluid, you're maintaining their pre-renal function. The problem is the iron pigment in, in the lysis of their muscle, that iron pigment is renally destructive. So that affects your tubules, and that's known as nephrotoxic tubular necrosis. Okay, so I can have tubular necrosis because I've had prolonged ischemia. That's a pre-renal problem. I can have kidney failure because I have poisoned the tubules of the kidney. And that's called nephrotoxic kidney failure. Okay, so really, really important when we're thinking about all these relationships. And we're going to just consider pre-renal, intrarenal, and post-renal kidney failure. Now, we're also going to remember, we're always going to look at urine output. Okay, so let's... If your patient is less than 0 0.5 or greater than 1.5 per hour, and we're looking at that really not over two hours, if we see that over eight hours, if we see that over 12 hours or 24 hours, that's gonna be urgent. Now, now we're gonna say, okay, and how much urine did you make in 24 hours? If you made less than 400 uh, mLs of urine in 24 hours, that is an indication of failure of the kidney. Now, it may not be a kidney infarct, it might just be a pre-renal problem, which is the easiest form to address, give volume, give pressure, give cardiac output. That's how you address pre-renal failure. So very, very important. There are discussions about what is oliguria and what is anuria. So anuria is less than 100 mils in 24 hours. Oliguria is less than 400, but greater than 100 in 24 hours. So those are terminologies that are used oftentimes on the test. We hardly ever discuss that clinically. Now, when we have somebody with ARF, we're gonna make our diagnosis through, of course, standard evaluations, okay? Standard evaluations, looking at their CBC, looking at BUN and creatinine, not just BUN and creatinine, but the ratio, the proportional ratio. So normal BUN is 10 to 20 times creatinine, okay? So the ratio is 10 to 20. Normal BUN is less than 20, Normal creatinine is less than really 1.5, okay? So BUN divided by creatinine gives you the ratio and the ratio helps us to pinpoint where your problem is. Now in clinical practice, that's pretty hard to do to pinpoint where your problem is because patients don't read the rules and they don't obey the rules of laboratory analysis. But on your exam, it's gonna be very clear cut your BUN is 70 and your creatinine is three. 70 divided by three is greater than 20, right? 70 divided by three is somewhere around 25, 28, maybe a little bit more. I'm doing it in my head, so forgive me for my bad math. So we're gonna look at BUN, we're gonna look at creatinine, we're gonna look at the ratio. We're also gonna use something very important that oftentimes will be referred to on your exam. And that is called a renal indicator. And that renal indicator is known as fractional excretion of sodium, FINA. Normal FINA, fractional excretion of sodium, is less than 1%. Anything greater than 2% means that your tubes are not reabsorbing your sodium and you're excreting it because you've got tubular failure. We can do a renal ultrasound. We can do renal Doppler, Doppler. So let's just take a little lab profile here of this patient and this patient over time. When we first see the patient on uh, February 13th, patient's BUN is 34 and creatinine is 2.6. Okay. 
So BUN is way up, creatinine is way up, right? And proportional ratio is around 15, okay? On 227, BUN is up more, creatinine is up much more. Now that creatinine is going up much more aggressively than the BUN. Creatinine is cleared partially by the glomerulus, but also very significantly by the tubules. So as you see, creatinine starts to go up more aggressively. That means you now have tubular involvement. In the beginning, your BUN goes up aggressively, your creatinine goes up mildly, you have pre-renal failure. When your creatinine starts to go up really aggressively, you either have rhabdomyolysis or you have tubular dysfunction. So you can see as time goes by, how much that patient's creatinine has gone up. Now their BUN has gone up pretty aggressively as well. This is a, a really bad prediction for this patient. Okay, so our three categories for renal dysfunction for kidney failure, pre-renal, before the kidney, volume and pressure. So again, hypovolemia, hemorrhage, vascular tone, cardiac output, pre-renal, okay? So, you know, diagnostically, you'll say hypovolemic shock, you can say septic shock, but what I want you to remember is if I have a failure of maintaining renal volume and renal pressure, that's a pre-renal problem. Try to fix it. Try to fix it right away. Try to protect your patient's kidneys. Then we move to intrinsic acute kidney injury. Intrinsic acute kidney injury is either prolonged pre-renal failure, which remember, think about pre-renal as angina. Treat it. If it doesn't get treated, you then infarct. And you infarct the oxygen-dependent portion of the kidney, and that's the tubule. So acute tubular necrosis, acute tubular injury, comes because we didn't treat the pre-renal condition. The majority of patients who develop kidney injury and kidney failure in the ICU is because we did not treat pre-renal failure. We thought we were doing it because we're going up and up and up on your catecholamines, but we're not restoring renal volume and we're not really restoring renal pressure. We're just treating a number and we're not really looking at perfusion, okay? The number one cause of acute kidney injury in a hospital, in an ICU, is untreated pre-renal failure. Now, other causes occur because of renal poisoning or, or tubular poisoning, I should say. Poisoning of a very fragile barrier of the tubule. It's like a little hair-like projectile barrier. It's called a brush barrier. And that very fragile barrier in the tubules of the kidney is very prone to poisoning. So we know that one of the major poisonings is an increase in free iron. Free iron occurs when you have hemolysis. Free iron occurs when you break down skeletal muscle. We free iron, iron is the pigment that makes blood red. Iron is the pigment that makes skeletal muscles red. So when we break down blood, we free iron. When we break down muscle, we free iron. Iron is really toxic and it poisons that brush border. That's called nephrotoxic, acute tubular necrosis. So it's either ischemic or it's nephrotoxic. Really, there are other things, but no one's gonna ask you about that. Lots of our drugs actually are renally toxic. So we already know that. You just, you need to know, no one's going to say, uh, if, if there's no other reason for your patient to have acute tubule necrosis, they've got good pre-renal function, they're making a lot of urine, but their creatinine has gone up aggressively and your doctor, they'll say, he's diagnosed with nephrotoxic acute tubule necrosis, whatever drugs they list there. If the patient didn't have rhabdomyolysis, it's the drugs. You've got to stop the drugs. You've got to stop vancomycin. You've got to stop genomycin. All the myosin agents, almost all of them, are nephrotoxic. And that's why we're so care careful about the administration of them. Okay. All right. And then we talk about post-renal AKI. So that means from the collecting duct to the bladder to the urethra, uh, I'm sorry, collecting duct to the urethra, to the bladder, to other way around, sorry, sorry. Collecting duct to the ureters, to the bladder, to the urethra, there's some kind of occlusion. Could be a renal stone, could also be free fluid in the abdomen, compressing the kidney or compressing the outflow of the kidney. 
It could be batter, uh, bladder atonicity. You can't empty your bladder. You could have an airlock in your Foley catheter, which prevents you from emptying your urine. Your bladder can't overcome the airlock and you can't drain the urine. So the patient's got a great big bladder with a lot of volume, but they're not emptying. Those are post-kidney. Pre-renal is easy to treat. Most post-renal is easy to treat. What's not easy to treat is once you've infarcted or destroyed your tubules. That's the one that's really a problem. Now, if I obstruct outflow of urine, the urine is gonna back up and it's now gonna cause swelling of the kidney known as hydronephrosis. So you ultimately will have kidney destruction if you don't treat it. If you don't treat pre-renal failure, you're ultimately gonna have in internal kidney fun dysfunction. That's acute tubular necrosis. So I got to treat pre-renal, got to treat post-renal. I got to try to protect you from tubular necrosis. That's the one that's really bad. So everything you're going to do on your tests and your practice is about protecting your patient from acute tubular necrosis. Okay, so again, pre-renal, intra-renal, post-renal. And the circle is showing you where your focus is. So if your patient has pre-renal dysfunction, you're gonna focus on volume and pressure. You're gonna focus on cardiac output and stroke volume. You're gonna focus on the patient's volume load to try to protect them in pre-renal failure. With ATN, if they're infarcting their tubule, you may use diuretic therapy, not necessarily to promote diuresis, but just to protect the functional tubule from actually consuming a lot of oxygen. And if it's post-renal, you're gonna to try to find out what the obstruction is and remove it. Does that make sense? Pretty straightforward. Pre-renal before the kidney, post-renal after the kidney, intrarenal inside the kidney. Inside the kidney is either renal poisoning or prolonged ischemia. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, all right. So 55 to 60% acute renal failure is pre-renal, common causes, volume depletion, decreased cardiac output, inability to manage blood pressure. Most common cause of renal dysfunction in the ICU is untreated pre-renal failure. From my point of view, if I can't read a note and see that you had some discussion with the provider about what was occurring to your patient, if I can't look at your flow sheet and see that you were collecting urine every hour and that you're actually evaluating the average of urine, I feel that you're, you are negligent. I'm just gonna be honest. Because this is really simple to say, I'm gonna do my best to protect your kidney. And it's not just by titrating vasopressors, right? The expectation is we're gonna have a bigger view, a more critical analysis, a more critical point of view when we look at our patients. This is the most common form of kidney dysfunction. On the exam, it will be clear if it's a pre-renal cause. It will be clear if it's an intrinsic renal failure cause. It will be clear that it's obstructive. And you need to know those three categories because those will be the questions that will be asked. And you've got to be able to say, oh, it's pre-renal. So I'm going to, I might put the patient on an inotrope if that's an option. I'm going to give the patient volume if that's an option. I'm going to drive up the blood pressure if that's an option. I might do all three if that's an option. If it's pre-renal though, probably not going to diurese you because you aren't getting adequate volume and pressure through the glomerulus. Okay, all right. So I always say that's precursed. Your patient is precursed when they have pre-renal. This is a curse because it's ins insidious. And unless we're really evaluating the patient, we might, not, we might not actually be looking for this. So this means we have a decreased effective blood volume, which I say arterial volume. You've got CHF, you've got cirrhosis, you have nephrotic syndrome, you have sepsis. You have renal vasoconstriction or supreme and profound renal vasodilation. Those are all reasons that you're going to see pre-renal failure. What I want you to remember, so of course, we're going to look at these patients with pre-renal failure. And what we're going to, first of all, is we're going to examine them for signs of hypovolemia. Now, remember, if they have pure hypovolemia, they'll have all the signs of being dry. If they have heart failure, they're not going to have pure hypovolemia. They have arterial hypovolemia and venous hypervolemia. So always be careful when you're evaluating, you're looking at signs and symptoms that they're giving you. And they're saying, okay, skin is dry. Mucous membranes are dry. Patient has orthostatic. They have poor skin turgor. Their neck veins are flat. You take a look with ultrasound. The IVC is compressible. That means the neck vein is flat. Patient's hypovolemic. 
total body. Give that patient volume. But patients who have volume in the veins and the interstitium and who have heart failure will be arterially hypovolemic. That's not gonna be as easy to diagnose, but it's something you need to be aware of. So remember, those are the two major causes. You have no volume or you have volume, but it's in the wrong space, right? What you're gonna use here is the BUN is gonna go up aggressively and the creatinine is gonna go up mildly. And on an exam, not necessarily in your real life, but on an exam, that means the proportional ratio is greater than 20 to one. So if you're seeing that ratio is greater than 20 to one, your assumption immediately is that it's pre-renal failure. Patient typically is oliguric and their urine shows you that they still have tubular function because the urine is concentrated. The tubes are who are responsible for concentration and dilution and your urine is concentrated. So whatever they're trickling, they're concentrating. But here's the most important thing. Urine sodium, less than 20, because the tubules aren't wasting it. Fena, less than, uh, it's actually 0.1. Actually, it's 1%, so 0.01, 1%. So urine sodium, less than 20, Fena less than 1% or 0.01. That tells you, along with the fact that your urine is concentrated, that tells you your tubes are working. This BUN creatinine ratio tells you that your glomerulus is not. That means you're going to go forward trying to treat effective arterial volume. You're going to give volume, you're going to give an inotrope, and if you must, you'll use a vasopressor. But you don't use a vasopressor in replacement of volume and cardiac function. You have to give volume, you have to give cardiac function, and then you add in a vasopressor if necessary. Okay. All right, so that kind of goes over that again. BUN is up aggressively, creatinine is up mildly, the ratio is up, up, up. And remember, these are causes before the kidney causing renal dysfunction. Intrinsic acute renal failure, about 30 to 40% of cases. And the most common cause for that is prolonged pre-renal dysfunction. So again, I'm challenging you to go back to your bedsides when you're taking care of patients who are on vasopressors. And I'm challenging you to try to appreciate and understand that in the pursuit of pressure, you may be actually complicating kidney dysfunction. I want you to actually evaluate pre-renal failure I want you to actually evaluate progression. So remember, it starts as renal angina, pre-renal, and ends up as renal infarct. I want to challenge you to watch that progression, to actually evaluate it, and to communicate about it. And of course, remember, anything that is toxic to the kidney can also cause death of the cell. So we have ATN necrosis, that's from prolonged pre-renal failure, and we have uh, ATN from nephrotoxicity. So again, lots of agents. So anything that you think you'd be worried about taking orally, like mercury, right? Okay, so heavy metal solvents. Well, nobody's gonna take that on purpose, right? But we're thinking about our myosin drugs that those are all renally toxic. We're gonna to think about that. And then the pigments of muscle and blood. These are the most common things, and this is the kind of thing that ASM will ask you for, okay? So remember, your number one goal is I've got to get your intra-arterial volume stable. I have to maintain an adequate cardiac output, and then I'm going to add in a vasopressor. So arterial volume, maintain cardiac output, add in a vasopressor. Now, that's only going to work if the problem was pre-renal. If it's renal poisoning, I'm going to have to do something different. And the number one thing is, if I can, I'm going to, I'm going to discontinue the toxic agent. And I'm going to protect the tubules. Okay. So again, we're going to look at history. We're going to look at physical examination. But on lab, really important. And again, it's not always going to be this way in real life. It's not always going to be this way in real life. But on an exam, your creatinine will have gone up a lot and your BN, BUN will have gone up a lot and the ratio typically will be less than 10 to one. 
because the creatinine goes up more aggressively than the BUN when you have intrinsic problems. Okay. Now, when we go over here, I want to remind you the tubules are responsible for the concentration of urine. So when I infarct my tubules, my urine typically is not going to be very concentrated. It's going to be little, but it's not going to be concentrated. So it's going to be dilute urine. It's going to be low level urine. If it's pre-renal induced acute tubular necrosis, I'm not going to have much urine output, but that urine will not be concentrated. Okay. Patient will be wasting sodium in the urine. So remember, normal urine sodium less than 20. If I have ATN, urine sodium is going to be greater than 40. Okay, remember, it's not always going to be this way clinically, but on an exam. Urine sodium, I should not be wasting sodium if I have a normal salt load. I should be retaining sodium that retains water. Okay, if I have pre-renal failure, my urine sodium will be less than 20. If I have intrinsic renal failure, my urine sodium will be greater than 40. I'm going to be wasting sodium. FENA, normal FENA is less than 1%. With intrinsic renal failure, FENA is greater than 2%. And a lot of times when I look at the urine, I'm going to see byproducts of tubular destruction. I've infarcted my tubes. I've destroyed my tubes. So I'm going to slough off that lining of the tube and it's going to be in the urine. And that is called brown casts, brown bodies. You're, it's a very high degree of urinary sediment, but it has to be looked at under a microscope and tubular cells, brown bodies, granular casts. You are sloughing the tubules of your kidney. Oh my God, how awful, right? Okay, so if we just take a look, this is that brush border. This is where we actually reabsorb and secrete right here at that border, okay? And so what you're actually seeing up at the very top, that normal epithelium with the brush border, and now we're having some injury. We're having injury because of hyperinflammation, we're having injury because of sustained poor volume and poor flow, or because of nephrotoxicity. And what you start to see is cellular death, and those, those cells are sloughing off, and they're gonna appear in the urine. Okay, so that's why that's so important. It's why doing a full urinalysis is so important that we're actually going to send urine for evaluation and we're going to look at what they say. Now, basic labs are not going to look at the presence of brown bodies. Usually your nephrologist is going to go down the lab and look at it under a microscope. And this is what it looks like. These are the caps, the renal cells that have been sloughed and that are in the uh, evaluation. So I want to remind you, if it's ischemic, Intrinsic renal failure, creatinine goes up, BUN goes up, they go up relatively equally. So the ratio is normal. It's not more BUN than it is creatinine. It's BUN is up, creatinine is up because I infarcted the glomerulus, now I've infarcted the tubule, okay? Urine output is down, uh, but now because I've lost tubular function, even though my urine is sparse, it's very dilute because the tubule is responsible for the concentration. I've lost my tubule, okay? If it's nephrotoxic, creatinine is up aggressively, BUN isn't up so much because it didn't happen at the glomerulus, it only happened at the tubule. So creatinine is way up, BUN is mildly up. And at first the patient's gonna make a lot of urine output because they still have glomerular function. So they're making urine, the glomerulus filters everything. It's the tube's responsibility to reabsorb it. So patient is wasting, 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 wasting water. So they're very polyuric when you first see them. They will urinate themselves to death. So our first worry with those patients, those are patients who have nephrotoxic renal failure, patients who have rhabdomyolysis. Our first concern is replace volume. We got to replace volume. And then we're going to try to protect the tubule. Typically we protect the, uh, the tubule with something that binds like if it's, if it's lysis, hemolysis or muscle lysis, we're going to give mannitol. We're going to give mannitol and you're like, well, that's a diuretic. Patients already make a lot of urine. No, that's not why we're giving mannitol. Mannitol actually protects the brush border because mannitol binds the iron pigment. So we'll give mannitol because it binds the iron pigment and the reactive species. Um, bicarbonate because bicarbonate will neutralize the filtrate, acidotic filtrate will actually cause more renal destruction. So we give mannitol and we give bicarb and we give fluid 
to protect our patient who has acute, profound, nephrotoxic kidney injury. Okay, so just remember hemoglobin, myoglobin, iron pigment, poison, 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 poison. Why do you have hemoglobinuria, transfusion reactions, you're on ECMO, you're on Impella, you're on balloon pump, or you've had a blood reaction, okay? Why do you lyse your muscles? You're found down. So we see that with crush injuries. We see that with a, a, a fall where someone is laid on the bathroom floor for two days. They've got compression injury and they're gonna have rhabdomyolysis. So what we're gonna do is hydrate the patient, alkalinize the urine. We do that with bicarb. We're gonna actually chelate the iron with mannitol. And at that point, we may also promote some wasting and we might do that with Lasix. But the most important thing, volume, bicarb, mannitol. If you have evidence of hemolysis or muscle lysis. Post-renal failure, okay? Very important, only 5% of kidney uh, cases that we see in the ICU. And that's just an acute obstruction of the flow of urine, okay? So again, it could, be a, it could be a renal stone, it could be abdominal compartment syndrome, it could be a twisted Foley catheter, it could be a kinked Foley catheter. You're obstructing outflow. Single most important thing is that when we take a scanner to you, we see that your bladder is distended. And as your bladder distends, you're gonna have fluid back up into the functional kidney itself and you're gonna promote hydronephrosis. Lab predictions are not meaningful here. Lab predictions for pre-renal, fantastic. Lab predictions for ATN, fantastic, on a test. For post-renal failure, there's no testing criteria other than you're looking at the bladder and you're looking at whether or not the patient has some hydronephrosis. Okay, so lots of things that we can do. BUN creatinine ratio is not really meaningful, probably doesn't have urinary sediment, but what we're actually seeing is volume in the bladder. So we all do bladder scans. That is the common practice today. If your bladder is distended and you are not making much urine, you have an obstructive renal failure. Now don't assume this is innocuous. It is not because when my bladder's distended, that volume is going to back up into the functional kidney and cause renal failure. Okay. So it's not, it's not a simple thing. So of course, for this, always relieve obstruction, always relieve obstruction, relieve it by checking your Foley, by actually cathing the patient, removing the, uh, the, the, the urine, actually look at whether or not patients have abdominal compartment syndrome. At the very last class where I said, I'm going to do the bits and bobs of things that you need to know a little more about, I think you probably need to know a little more about abdominal compartment syndrome because it happens in a lot of your patients and it's not just trauma. It's in patients who are overhydrated. It's a very common problem with volume resuscitation. So we should really take a look at it. We'll, we'll take a little bit deeper dive. I'm just a five minute deeper dive. That'll be at the end. Okay. Um, if you've got uh, upper tract obstructions, that's really ureter to bladder, we're going to actually probably need to stent you. We're going to have to do some surgery. We're going to have to do something that relieves that. Okay, we might give you a nephrostomy tube, or we're going to do some stenting. We're going to do some intervention. Okay, so now I'm going to bring that together, okay? Pre-renal, renal ischemic, renal nephrotoxic. Pre-renal, BUN is up aggressively. Creatinine is up mildly. The ratio is greater than 20 to 1. Okay, patient is not wasting a sodium. So urine sodium is down, phena is down. Urine output is down, 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 down. Prolonged prerenal leads to ischemic tubular. BUN is up aggressively. Now creatinine is up aggressively because I've lost the tubes, which is where a lot of my creatinine is cleared. My BUN creatinine ratio is normal. So it's 10 to 20 to one. I mean, my, my BUN might be 90, my creatinine is nine but the ratio is normal. That's what tells me it's both glomerulus and tubular, okay? Fena, greater than 2%, okay? Urine output, down, 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 down. Urine sodium is high. Whatever's getting processed, I'm wasting a lot of salt, okay? And then nephrotoxic, right? really isn't about the glomerulus at the early stages. It's all about the tubules. I've poisoned the tubules. Creatinine is up, up, up. BUN probably not up very much. Some BUN, some urea 
is cleared by the tubules, but most of it was cleared at the glomerulus. So very important for us to appreciate that. Fena is up because I've destroyed the tubules. Urine output is up because I've got a functional glomerulus. So I'm making a lot of urine. It's just terrible urine, terrible urine. Urine sodium is high, phena is high, the urine is dilute, okay? So pre-renal, remember before the kidney, intra-renal in the kidney, and post-renal after the kidney, okay? So take a look. I'm gonna take these three patients and then we're gonna end for today, okay? So taking a look at your patient, case one, BUN is 60, creatinine is three, ratio is 30 to one. Pre-renal, intra-renal, post-renal. Pre-renal because your biggest failure is the clearance of BUN, which is primarily clear at the glomerulus. Good. Case number two, BUN 40, creatinine eight, ratio is five to one. Okay, remember your tubules are responsible for the clearance of creatinine. So if I've infarcted my tubule, but not my glomerulus, what I'm going to expect to see is creatinine is going to go up aggressively. This is nephrotoxic ATN. This is failure to get rid of creatinine, which is primarily cleared by the tubule. Postrenal, remember, postrenal, I'm not going to make those decisions based on this because none of the tests are specific, but, but very good job. Okay. Case number three, BUN 100, creatinine is 10, ratio is 10 to 1. Is this both glomerular and tubular? or is it just one? Both, because I failed to clear BUN, I failed to clear creatinine, and I failed to clear them both equally. Neither one is getting cleared. So just remember, the majority of BUN is cleared at the glomerulus, the majority of creatinine is cleared at the tubes. If I have loss of the glomerulus and then loss of the tubule, both BUN and creatinine go up, and they're up really high. There's nobody would disagree. This is indicating renal failure. But this means you had a prolonged pre-renal failure and now you've infarcted the tubes. Okay, everybody good? Feeling pretty good? All right. So uh, I'm gonna end here. Uh, I have some other little case studies, but it's two minutes after 10. I wanna be observant of your time. And I'm gonna tell you, thank you very much. Uh, when I see you the next time, when we do endocrinology, we'll do a little bit of review of kidney dysfunction. It's very, very important. What I'm going to encourage you because we have very limited time here, although it probably doesn't feel that way to you. It feels like, oh my God, there's so much time invested here. We're not going to have much time for electrolytes, but I'm going to refer you to my YouTube channel where I talk about potassium, sodium, calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. That's free. And looking at that, all this electrolyte abnormality is really, really important. We don't really have much time for that in this course. So I want you to really look at that. We will, of course, review the most common electrolyte abnormality that you see that is deleterious to your patient, which will be hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, and hypomagnesemia, which are really common. We will review those. All right, my friends, thank you very much for attending today. I want to make sure you remember that I am not here next week. I will not be here. Ginny Feigl will be here for the whole time. I will be... Uh, during this time, I will be presenting to a thousand people at NTI. I think somebody's at the door. That's probably Ginny. I'm going to go. I'm going to go through with Ginny uh, how to operate all of this because there's four things that she has to do to make this work. And uh, um, maybe Rachel, if you have a minute, you can stay. And then we have two people who know how to make sure it works, and that will be really great. Otherwise, I'm just going to say thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Do you feel See like you have? See you at NCI, Barbara. Okay, very good, Rose. So uh, do you feel like you have a better a little better understanding of renal dysfunction? Yes. Okay, good. And remember, we're, I'm challenging you to be following your patients and actually trying to make some predictions about what's occurring. Because if you apply it, you'll never forget it. Okay? All right. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'll see you in two weeks. Yeah, see you in NTI. I'll see you at NTI. You should not come to see me anytime at NTI, Rose. You need to listen to other speakers. You have me all the time. I know that you're, you're a vague supporter of me. So we'll see each other and we'll hug each other, but you're going to go to other speakers. Okay, thank you. All right, honey, bye. Bye. Hey, Jenny.